we just sang about this love of God. He loved his, us so much that he sent his son to die for us, right? There's probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? That verse is just really powerful to think about, and we're going to kind of continue to reflect on this theme of love this morning as we open our worship service. You'll notice at the end of this song, it says, bring all your failures Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. That's kind of nuts to think about, that God loves us so much that he wants us to bring everything, everything, even the ugly things, even the things that we wouldn't be comfortable bringing other people. God wants us to bring those to him because he loves us so much. This next song we sing, we're going to sing is also pretty well known. It's called Reckless Love. Maybe some of you've sung with us before. The song is based on a story in scripture that talks about this shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, right? And this shepherd goes and leaves the 99 sheep, which are much more financially important to the shepherd. And he goes and finds the one who was lost. And Jesus talks about how this, this shepherd's love for this one sheep is a little bit like the love that God has for us. So let's continue singing together about this love. Singing. 
lived your life for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Something powerful when we think about this love it doesn't always translate the same way. Maybe on Monday, this love feels different than Sunday. There's something about the walk of faith with walking with God and being a disciple of Jesus that it's important that we stay connected, stay connected to one another, stay connected to our heart of worship, stay connected to Scripture. This next song and this last song for this section that we're going to sing is called Full Attention. It talks about how we want to keep 
abiding in the uh, vine of God, that we want to stay connected to what God is doing. So I want to teach you this chorus. We've sung it a couple times before, um, but just so we're all on the same page, it goes like this. Please keep my eyes fixed on you. Please root my heart so deep in you. Keep me abiding. Keep me abiding. Keep me abiding that I, oh, that I might bear fruit. join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, it is our prayer that you would draw us to yourself and that, would, that you would root us in you. The psalmist declares, God, that, that our hope comes from you, that we find our rest in you. We pray that this morning in this space that we would be able to rest. 
that we would remember the reality of, of who we are, that we are mortal, that our days in this world are numbered, that we would remember the reality that you have entrusted to us this life, this time, this opportunity, that we might know you and serve you and love you, that we might care for one another. And so, God, be our rock and our refuge this morning. We pray that we would find the, the kind of deep rest that comes from knowing you and trusting in you, of experiencing your love and your power and your forgiveness in our lives. God, we want to know the peace that comes from faith. That peace that surpasses every circumstance, every diagnosis, every anxiety, every fear. And so shape us, shape us to to see the world the way you see the world and to see ourselves the way that you see us. Spirit, we ask that, that you would come into our minds and into our hearts and break down any walls of resistance that, that we have. Any place where we're reluctant to trust you and to obey your word. Jesus, bring light into the dark places of our hearts and of our lives that we might experience true life in you. Jesus, we thank you today for the gift of Christian community, for the people who surround us this morning, who sing your praises alongside us, who encourage us. And Lord, we ask your help in being the kind of Christian community you desire for us to be. Lord, help us to, to live into your call to be the body of Christ. Help us to receive each other and to accept each other and to forgive each other. Lord, help us to, to push each other, to, to push each other t towards you, towards deeper places of faithfulness and commitment to do that in love. And God, we pray that you'd give us the ability to carry one another. That when parts of the body are weak or struggling or hurt, God, help us to show up for each other in your name and to do it in your love. We pray today for... Mark and Nancy Wharton's daughter, Christy, as she continues her battle against cancer. God, we just lift her up to you this morning and ask that you would sustain her. God, give her the gift of closeness to you in this time. We pray that you would bring her healing. We pray too for Jane Duncan as she recovers and heals from successful back surgery. God, we pray for Ted and, and for Jane's family as they care for her. Lord, bring her comfort, minimize her pain. God, encourage her with clear progress. Lord Jesus, thank you for the ability to do this, to come to you in love, to come to you in honesty, and to pour our hearts out to you. Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Will we take a moment to welcome any of you who are visiting with us this morning. If this is your first time here at First Pres, we are so glad that you have joined us. And if you're joining us online, uh, welcome to you. If you're joining us online for the first time, welcome. I met a couple at the first service who said, you know, we, we kind of started out online. We were, we were checking you out from a living room, and now we've been coming a few times. And so if that's you online today, we are so thrilled that you have joined us. I have a favor to ask, whether you're participating online or in the service, and that is this. Would you let us know that you're here? So if you're in the sanctuary, if you would take and pass the friendship pads that are on the center aisle, and if you're participating online, Online, if you'd click the connect button on the First Press website or let us know if you're on Facebook or YouTube that you're with us, it's a tremendous help to the pastoral care ministry of the church to know that you joined us for worship this morning. As you're doing that, a couple of invitations to extend to you. Uh, gentlemen, we have a men's breakfast coming up, and it's a particularly manly men's breakfast. Uh, it will be uh, February 11th, and Jesse Scott, the head football coach at Wheaton College, will uh, be our speaker that morning. It's information in your bulletin and online on uh, how to get signed up for the men's breakfast. And then if you are the parent of a preschooler and want to know about kindergarten, Westminster Preschool is hosting a kindergarten readiness event Monday, January 23rd here in the sanctuary. Details on that are also in your bulletin. As we read about uh, this in the New Testament, uh, the, the early church gathering for worship, uh, we discover that the early church did a lot of the things that we're doing this morning. 
they gathered together in the temple courts and they sang God's praises. They studied the apostles' teaching, which is what we have in the scriptures. Um, they gathered together for fellowship, to encourage one another, to greet one another. And we read that they gave an offering. That when they gathered for this moment to, as a community to, to worship, one of the things the early church did was that we gave. The, the offering part is every bit as much a component of worship as singing or praying. And, and when we do that in a thoughtful and a disciplined way, when we come to integrate what God has entrusted to us in this life with our spiritual journeys, we acknowledge that this is a moment of, of God working. Not only God working in us, but God working through us. So what we're about to do is uh, not a mechanical thing. It's not a logistical thing. This is a, a spiritual thing. And so let me pray for us before we do that. Lord Jesus, you invite us to experience you, to experience you at work in our lives, bringing transformation. And when we call you Lord, that means um, that you're our boss. You're, you're the boss of our spiritual lives and our prayer lives and our worship lives and our family lives. And, and you're Lord of our stuff as well. And so God, we surrender to you um, ourselves. And I pray that as we lay this offering uh, before you, that you would take it and you would bless it and you would multiply it and you would use it to build your kingdom here on earth. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If the ushers would please come forward. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that is within me, bless his name. He forgives all our sin, he is slow to anger, full of grace. As high as the heavens are up above, so is the greatness of his love as far as the east is from the west. He removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west. For the Lord knows our friends short our days from dust to dust we fade but his love will remain merciful to those who fear his name as high as the heavens are up above so is the greatness of his love as far as the east is from the west he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the east is from the west. The steadfast love of the Lord.
that I preach that I do not tend to uh, get on it too uh, far in advance. And, uh, and as in, it's mostly the last few days that I'm pulling things together, and I'm sitting here very astonished this morning with the number of pieces that were sung this morning, uh, chosen by our, our band leaders uh, that tie in beautifully with today's message in the scriptures, and I know that was not unintentional, so they do, just a reminder of the exceptional job they do to, to tie things together, um, so thank you. And I've had a head cold all week, so if I have sort of a little more mainly that manly man voice you expect at the men's breakfast that Chris <laughs> referred to, <clears throat> if I have that, or if it's annoying, that's because of my head cold. When my brother, nine years older than me, went to college, uh, I got his room. And for years after that, I had posters thumbtacked to the tongue and groove pined, uh, pine boards in that cozy room that I had. And I w remember one poster up there from th my third grade into seminary. Now, this wasn't it, but it gives the idea. It was a huge black and white poster of a lion with a kitten sitting gently embraced by the lion's paw. It was, a, it was really quite large, and it was, it was very beautiful and tender. I love that poster. I wish I could have found it online to show you and to remember together. Then I had several smaller posters, Argus brand, I think. Uh, many of you probably had those in the day, maybe still. I, I don't know. One of them had a picture, but with this saying from a uh, little prince, or Le Petit Prince. Isn't that right, Mary Glenn? Did I get that? It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. A solid and quite biblical idea. As I shared here a few years back, I came to Christ after my freshman year in high school, and soon thereafter, I acquired this poster titled, I Am. I even took it to college with me. I loved this poster. I didn't realize how popular it was in that era. I easily found it online this week, where I read that this poster with the names of Christ existed in many different forms, but this particular one by Rose Publishing is now among the most requested, but out of print posters. It says, it adorned the walls of many teenagers' bedrooms and recreation rooms. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> Under each of the different biblical names for Jesus was a scripture citing where it could be found. I found this poster to be meaningful and helpful, um, to be meaningful and helpful through those years in my faith. In fact, since much of my private prayer over those years was in my bedroom, I used it a great tool, a great deal as a tool for prayer. I would draw on the different names or qualities of Jesus as part of prayer and praise and adoration of him. I hope you are able to do the same in your own prayer life through some means. Let me share a little story about those names for Jesus. My sophomore year in high school, several kids got together, including me and my two sisters closest in age to me, and Craig Fee, former youth director here from the mid-80s, who were in high school together in college, and others were there. Well, we decided to start a youth fellowship. It is a great story. It's a, not a short story, so I won't say much about it. But just to say, it ended up meeting for the next five years at my parents' house. God bless my parents. There was a room at one end of the house over the garage, we called it the playroom, and between 10 and 40 high schoolers came every week for all of those years, and it was all run by us, the students. It was creatively called Thursday Night Fellowship. I won't tell you when it met. <laughs> On a few occasions, we had all-night prayer gatherings with prayer and singing throughout the night. As one of them was winding down, we were in a circle, and standing, I believe, and we were praising God in the form of names and qualities of God, and I think maybe I had dropped to my knees, and someone said, Jesus, you are the door, because Jesus said he is the door through which all will find pasture and be saved. Well, I had been kneeling and apparently had nodded off, and when they said, the door, I shot up and said, the door, the door, somebody's at the door. <laughs> it was our house, so, you know, I felt responsible. We are in a sermon series entitled, The Character of God. Can we trust him? Unlike me, Psalm 121 assures us that our God slumbers not, nor sleeps. 
In this series, we have noted the relationship between God's characteristics, his qualities, that is, and God's character, that is, his nature, his temperament, and his disposition towards us. Now, that I am poster I owned reflected titles that generally referred to Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Well, I don't uh, have a poster for this one, but what are some of those key names or titles that indicate to us the qualities and the character of the first person of the Trinity? For throughout Scripture, one way God reveals himself to us, reveals qualities of his character, is through his names and their meanings. And when we pay attention to those names that he reveals to us, we better understand who God is. So let's take a quick look at names for God in Scripture. And we start right at the beginning. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The name for God here is Elohim, which is a more general name and is translated as God or Creator. It is used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament. And then move right to the next chapter, uh, Genesis 2. We see the name Yahweh, which is the idea of the Lord or the alternative Jehovah, which came in the Middle Ages as the Latinized version. We see Yahweh over 6,500 times in the Old Testament Hebrew. Those are the two primary names for God. And again, uh, they describe different characteristics of the same God an emphasis the, that the author clearly wants to make clear to us. Elohim is used in the context of God as creator, as distant and powerful, awesome and majestic. And Yahweh is, is God's personal name and is used in the context of God having a relationship with his people. When God goes about creating humans in Genesis 2, it is Yahweh who does this act. When personally involved with his people, Yahweh is the proper way to designate him. And in English, generally the word Lord we see with capital letters. The third most common is Adonai, which means my Lord or my master. We see Adonai over 400 times, and it tends also to be translated as Lord in English, but not in all capital letters. Yahweh, Lord in caps, Adonai, Lord in lowercase. A little confusing. And please know that this distinction in the divine names holds true throughout all the scriptures. The different names reflect a different emphasis on God's character in his dealings with his people. While one list I saw recorded, count them, 952 names in the scripture for members of the Trinity, yeah, let me just briefly name a few others, but not quite all those. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, 285 times. El Elyon, the Most High God, 28 times. El Shaddai, the Lord Al God Almighty, seven times. And then from there, almost all the other names for God occur only one or two times in the Old Testament indicating more, actually, God's more personally engaging, like the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is there, the Lord that heals, the Lord my banner, the Lord our righteousness, and on and on it goes. So you get a solid taste of the richness of God's character revealed in his many names and his many titles. Now, if you happen to note the sermon title, you know there's another name that we are headed towards, and we're headed there, as you can see, slowly. It occurs 13 times in the Old Testament, referring to God. It is the two-letter Hebrew word av, or ab, meaning father, like in Abraham, the father of many nations, as in the word abba. Now, not the band, who interestingly, interestingly drew uh, their, the name Abba from the first letters of the names of the four band members' first names. In case you didn't know. But <clears throat> I didn't know that. Um, but the word Abba, which is used in the New Testament, <clears throat> it's used by Jesus once and Paul twice, referring to Abba, Father. 
Abba is a word that has generally been considered to be Aramaic in origin, not Hebrew. But interestingly, most who speak Hebrew nowadays use the word Abba instead of Ab or Av for father. But just in case you were keeping score at home, for referring to God or father, Jesus most often used these words, theos, Curio, uh, theos for God, curios for Lord, and pater, pater for Father, all to refer to God. So aside from this very familiar word or title of Father throughout the scripture, there is also much fathering imagery. And it should be noted that there is also mothering and other parenting imagery also in the scripture in reference to the different members of the Trinity. Jesus used the term father frequently, and he greatly deepened our understanding of both, his, of both his relationship with the Father and our relationship with God the Father. Jesus referred to God, his Father, 150 times, and he spoke of God as being our Father 30 times. Let me note clearly that those relationships, those relationships are different and distinct relationship. Our Relationships, our relationship with God the Father and Jesus' relationship with God his Father. And let me also note that Jesus referring to God as Father didn't bring pleasure at all to the religious leaders of his day. They considered it blasphemy to call God Father because they perceived that to mean that Jesus was saying he was equal to God. And they perceived correctly. As we think today of the character and names of God, like Father, let me ask you, who is God to you? Who is God to you? Is he your most high God, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord your shepherd? Is he your Lord and master, the one who will provide? Is he your heavenly Father, you see, God knows everything about us and very much knows our name. He knows us by name. But do we know him by name or do we know him by his character? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. To hallow is to make holy or to set apart, to be exalted as being worthy of absolute devotion. To hallow the name of God is to regard him with complete devotion and loving admiration. God's name is of the utmost importance, and we should reserve it a position of unequal significance in our minds, in our hearts, and upon our lips. May we never take his name lightly, but rejoice in it and think deeply upon his true name and his true character. Now, looking into God's character in this series and looking at some of the names of God today, including the truth of God as Father, we don't do this for the purpose of gathering information so we simply understand better, to increase our intellectual awareness or to satisfy our curiosity. Now, be assured there is much value to deepening our understanding as we grow in our relationship with the one who is beyond our comprehension. But as for our connection to God, our job, our job is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And part of that job, the scriptures make it clear, like in passages such as Psalm 148, the scriptures make it clear. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. That is what we are to do now and will do throughout eternity. We are to direct our knowledge and understanding and experience of God into the praise and worship of him. And that is right where our sermon text for today takes us. Psalm 103. 
I won't unpack this psalm today, but let, let us take it in now and allow it to direct us to the praise and worship of God as we turn our understanding of God's character, as we turn our understanding of God's character into the worship of him. This was highlighted beautifully in the offertory song we heard earlier. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were formed. We, he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a field, flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. As we read this beautiful and inviting psalm of David, it seems that David, in writing it, begins to reflect on and to recall God's huge and varied blessings upon his life. And when he, as he remembers, as he remembers, he is overcome with praise to God. He cannot help but praise him for all that he has done. He is overwhelmed with God's goodness, and so he praises him. He speaks of God's personal blessings, his forgiving love, and then he ends the psalm with a call for all believers to give praise to God. And that means you and me. With all that God has showered, has showered and showered upon us as most undeserving people, isn't our Lord God Almighty worthy of our worship and praise? And if he is worthy, is he getting that from you and from me and from us? Bob Dylan sang that you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Similarly, who or what do you worship in your life? We are wired to worship. You've got to worship somebody or something. And as we soak in this series on the character of God, hear this from theologian N.T. Wright. He says, you become like what you worship when you gaze in awe and admiration and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. Friends, that is both scary and invigorating. So let us choose wisely and rightly and worship the one and only true God. Now this psalm doesn't actually use the name of Father for God. You might have noticed that. But it, it in one verse gives a direct comparison of human fathering to God's character. Yet I would say, suggest that throughout this psalm, there is a nurturing lang language that clearly depicts fathering, mothering, parenting qualities. And if you were to try to encourage a new father or mother or parent in what it takes, this psalm would be a great place to start. Redeeming, healing, 
loving, being compassionate, providing good things, renews you, is just, is righteous, is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, doesn't harbor anger or treat us as our wrongdoing deserves. And then from there, the psalm moves into a direction that only can match with the character of our Heavenly Father and is well beyond human ability. But as we read of David's reflection and praise for God's incredible care and blessings, may we see that this psalm and that the psalms in general and the scriptures as a whole are in part a guide for each of us to approach God. They are a gift for us in part to direct our lives and to direct our praise towards our loving Heavenly Father. Not unlike that I Am poster did for me. And we know that Jesus himself was driven to such prayer and praise time and time again. And if he needed to be, to, to be in communication with his Father, how much more can it be said of us with our Heavenly Father? How much more can it be said of us? Us who are, are not the only begotten Son of the Father. Us who were lovingly created out of dust. But we were not sons and daughters of the Most High. While made in the image of God, we quickly soiled ourselves with sin. All our unrighteousness covered us very much like filthy rags. We were impoverished and so very needy. Nothing like heirs of the king, children of the highest. But then as we read in Isaiah 1, come now, come now and reason together, says the Lord. Although your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. We could be made clean because of what was proclaimed earlier in the opening song. Because God the Father so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever would believe in him should not die but have eternal life. And as Paul tells us in Romans 8, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, God adopted us like his own children, washed us clean, dressed us in robes of righteousness, and gave us the immense privilege, the privilege of calling him Father. We've been adopted into his family and warmly invited to sit at the royal table. God the Father and God the Son went to the extent of allowing Jesus to suffer and die as he did so that we, each of us, could be reconciled to God and be called children of God so that we could really say, Abba, Father. But it was none of our doing. Our great tendency is to look out for ourselves to look out for ourselves and our families. But God, as we've just remembered, clearly chose a very different route. You see, we hugely tend towards my well-being at your expense. That is the way of the world. But our Heavenly Father's love and His kingdom values prioritized our well-being at His expense. To put it another way, natural human response and most religion says this, I messed up, my father's gonna kill me. But as children of the heavenly father, we can cry out, I messed up. I need my father, I need to call my father. While God longs for our love for him and our obedience to him and oh so very much more, and as, as we see in the scriptures, regardless of our choices and our behaviors, he pursues us as our loving Heavenly Father. He pursued Adam and Eve after they sinned. He pursued Cain after he killed his brother. He pursued Hagar when she ran to die with Ishmael. 
He pursued Moses into the wilderness. He pursued David after his taking of Bathsheba. Jesus tells us in the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the son of the father's love, loving pursuit of us, just like, again, the song that we heard sung. He left the 99 in pursuit of the one. Searching earnestly, he searched earnestly for the missing coin and threw a party to celebrate. And he celebrates the return of the lost son, once dead and now alive, once lost and now found. Indeed, we are not worthy. We are not worthy of being pursued and celebrated by God, nor could we ever be worthy on our own. But for us, for us, our loving Heavenly Father sent the model. We are to love as God loved us, or as Jesus framed in his new commandment, love one another, love one another as I have loved you. Trappist monk, writer, and many more things, Thomas Merton called us to reflect the heart of our Heavenly Father this way. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. And we learn that. We learn that from our loving Heavenly Father. Let's pray. We pause to praise you. Praise you for being our Abba Father. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your wisdom and your loving kindness. We know that anxiety comes so easily to many of us, especially as we focus on our personal and just deeper challenges of the day. To you, our Father, we confess our worries and we ask for your peace. We thank you that you are a good, good Father who longs to bring comfort but you are also the sovereign king who sustains all things by your powerful word. May we hear the words of Isaiah 64. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing Like that.
time has come still my soul will sing your praise now the benediction to our fragile world peace with justice the United States of America righteousness and our relationships at home and abroad to this community a deep sense of mercy and compassion towards the least of these and to each of you deep confirmation of God the Father's love for you and calling you by name and sending you forth to love others in his name Go now in peace. Amen.